on World News Tonight. Mending Ties Another high-profile visit to China from the US, this time by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Media Blackout Macron calls to cut off social media during riots sparking backlash in France. Clash of the Tech Titans Meta debuts threads in the latest move of the Musk Zuckerberg war. And a spherical spectacle. Las Vegas strikes once again with another iconic entertainment behemoth. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and you are watching World News Tonight. Another high-profile visit was made to China by U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen for four days starting today following the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's recent visit. Her trip will aim to soothe the tense U.S.-China relations. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is visiting China starting from July 6th to 9th to discuss economic and trade relations. This marks a second visit by a high-ranking U.S. official recently, with U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken previously visiting in June. Yellen is expected to meet Prime Minister Li Chang, Vice Prime Minister He Lifang, Minister of Finance Liu Kun and other key Chinese figures. Yellen, who has previously served as a chair of the Federal Reserve, has advocated for an improvement in U.S.-China relations. Experts anticipate that the agenda will include U.S. de-risking and China's export control and rare metals. Recently, the U.S. has restructured its advanced technology supply chain in a strategy known as de-risking. In response, China has retaliated by imposing sanctions on the U.S. semiconductor company Micron since May in order to strengthen its negotiation power. On July 3rd, China also decided to control the export of gallium and germanium, which are crucial rare metals used in semiconductor production. Secretary Yellen's visit to China could have significant importance for the future direction of competition and conflicts between the U.S. and China. Chinese media outlet Global Times have stated on Wednesday that there should be specific discussions on how to address the issues that have harmed the development of economic and trade relations between the two countries. Tel Aviv is run amok with thousands steaming the streets in protest of central authority. The demonstrations came following the city police chief's decision to quit the force citing Prime Minister Netanyahu's influence. Gridlock and water cannons in Tel Aviv as thousands protest a crisis engulfing the city's police and the country's government. People waving Israeli flags brought traffic to a standstill on Wednesday evening, lighting fires and facing off against police on horseback. The demonstrations came after Tel Aviv's police commander said he was quitting the force. He said he was leaving over political intervention by members of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's hard right cabinet. The commander said he'd been asked to use excessive force against anti-government protesters. Demonstrators voiced their anger on the ground. This is exactly what you see here in Israel, how dictatorship looks like. I think this is one step further for Israel to be a non-democratic state. Tensions ran high throughout the evening, in particular after a car drove through the protest, hitting at least two people and knocking one of them to the ground. Tel Aviv District Commander Ami Ished, the police chief who quit, did not say who gave him the orders to crack down hard on protesters. Far-right National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gavir has reportedly demanded tough action against protesters blocking roads and highways weekly since January. Ben-Gavir said in a statement, quote, Politics has seeped into the most senior ranks in Israel and a uniformed officer has caved to senior politicians on the left. The year has seen unprecedented demonstrations against the government's contentious push to overhaul the justice system. Concerns about police independence grew after Ben Gavir was given greater authority over the force. Despite recanting some of his hardline views, Ben Gavir's appointment to the nationalist religious coalition government of Netanyahu has alarmed liberals at home and abroad. Other members of Netanyahu's government have claimed that police have treated protesters in Tel Aviv favorably compared to settlers and ultra-Orthodox demonstrators. 
President Emmanuel Macron's government faced a backlash after the centrist leader called for powers to cut off social media in case of widespread violence like riots over the past week in France. Suspending certain features on social media platforms. That could be the next move from President Emmanuel Macron's government as it scrambles to avoid a repeat of days of violence that have rocked the country. You have some geolocation apps that allow youngsters to gather at certain locations, showing the places and how to start fires. These are incitements to hatred in public places. You would have to suspend the app as long as it takes to intervene. Olivier Véran's comments come after President Emmanuel Macron called for social media to be cut off in situations of widespread violence in the country. The French leader is pointing the finger at platforms like Snapchat, TikTok and Telegram, charging them of being used as tools by coordinating attacks. Macron also blames the apps for fueling unrest by spreading images of violence. Le scrutin est clos. The proposal to restrict access has been met with backlash, with politicians accusing Macron of using the platforms as a scapegoat. Conservative parliamentary chief Olivier Marlet took to Twitter to express his grievances. Cut off social networks like China, Iran or North Korea. Even if it's a provocation to distract attention, it's in very bad taste. Even voices from within Macron's Renaissance camp say banning access would be the wrong move. MP Eric Botorel tweeted that cutting off social networks would mean giving up on the idea that democracy is stronger than the tools used against it. Macron's government now insists a ban is not on the table. Instead, it wants to bring together lawmakers to discuss how best to alter an existing social media bill currently under debate. With that latest move of blocking social media by the French president, the riots and arrogance of civilians keep escalating. And to get more details on this, let's cross over to other there in a world news special correspondent, Chetana Dharmaratna, joining us from Paris in France. Chetana, over to you. Yes, Shanali. Children as young as 12 or 13 have been detained for attacking law enforcement and setting fire during six nights of violence after the fatal police shooting of the 17-year-old Nihal Mazouk in the suburban Paris. The Interior Minister Gerald Daminin said that the average age of the 3,354 people arrested over the past week was 17. In all, 99 town halls have been attacked during the unrest including an attempt to run a burning vehicle into the home of Lais Les Roses, Mayor Vangsan Jombran. Mr. Jombran said in an emotional speech that they saw the real faces of the rioters, that of the assassins. France and the democracy itself were being attacked in the days of the rioting, he said. Meanwhile, an insulting fundraiser set up for the family of the police officer who shot Nihal has amazed more than 1 million euros. Organized by the Messiha, a former advisor to the French far-right politician Marine Lupin. The appeal has raised far more than the donation page set up for the family of the teenage victim. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you, Chetana. That was Chetana Dharmaratna reporting from Paris in France. Now to the war in Ukraine. Reports say Russian forces are facing huge troop losses amid Ukraine's counter-offensive. This comes following the death of a man who set off an explosive device at a courthouse in the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. The explosion left multiple officers injured. Russia's forces are continuing to face huge troop losses in Ukraine with a sharp spike over the last two months. According to the latest figures released by the General Staff of the Ukrainian Armed Forces on Tuesday, Russian troop losses since the start of Vladimir Putin's full-scale invasion on February 24, 2022, stood at 231,030. This figure comes amid Ukraine's counteroffensive, which started at the beginning of June and is more than 31,000 higher than the 200,000 milestone, which Kyiv claimed on May 17. Exact numbers are difficult to assess with other Western estimates putting the Russian toll much lower. The figures come as the city of Donetsk remains a key target of Ukraine's counteroffensive. 
The Ukrainian military's Tavria Regional Command spokesperson said on Tuesday that Kyiv's troops had advanced up to 1.4 miles, or roughly 2 kilometers in the southern Berdansk direction. Ukraine is also reportedly making gains across the Dnieper River near Kherson. President Volodymyr Zelensky, however, admitted last week that progress in the counteroffensive had been slower than desired. President Zelensky also stated that Russia was the only source of danger to Europe's largest nuclear facility, the Zaporizhia power plant in southeastern Ukraine. On Tuesday, in his nightly video message, he said Russia was planning to simulate an attack on the plant, claiming that Russian troops had placed objects resembling explosives on the roofs of buildings at the site. Ukraine and Russia accused each other the same day of plotting to attack the plant. Earlier on Tuesday, Zelensky briefed French President Emmanuel Macron on Russia's dangerous provocations at the plant. Zelensky said he and Macron had agreed to keep the situation under maximum control together with the IAEA, the UN's nuclear watchdog. We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now, Hong Kong National Security Police have arrested four men accused of providing financial support to people who fled overseas and are involved in activities endangering national security, es escalating a high-profile crackdown in the city. Hong Kong National Security Police arrested four people on Wednesday, accusing them of financially supporting overseas dissidents and of advocating for Hong Kong's independence from China. Two sources with knowledge of the matter told that Ivan Lem, the former chairman of the now disbanded pro-democracy group Demosisto, was among those arrested. In a statement, police said they arrested four men for suspected conspiracies to foreign collusion and doing acts with seditious intent. The four were suspected of receiving funds from operating companies, social platforms and mobile applications to support people who have fled overseas and continue to engage in activities that endanger national security. Police did not name the suspects or provide details of the alleged offences. Local media, citing unnamed sources, connected the arrest of people to an app known as Punish Me a platform available on the Apple and Google Play stores that congregates businesses that support the pro-democracy movement. The arrests came just two days after the Hong Kong police made a high-profile announcement that it had issued warrants and bounties for eight overseas-based activists over national security-related offences. Hong Kong Chief Executive John Lee said on Tuesday that the aid would be pursued for life. Tragedy struck Mexico after a passenger bus lost control and veered off a road and into a 75-foot-deep gully in southern Mexico, killing as many as 29 passengers and injuring another 19. The bus, traveling from Mexico City through southern Oaxaca state, crashed when the driver is believed to have lost control of the vehicle in the town of Magdena, Penasco. Officials confirmed that 14 people were hospitalized in the town of Tlaxiaco, while five others were airlifted to the state capital of Oaxaca City. Photos shared on social media by law enforcement show damaged metal railing on the side of the road, as well as a contorted wreckage of the bus surrounded by emergency workers and what appears to be bodies covered in sheets at the bottom of the ravine. The incident is one of the largest cases of deadly crashes that have killed dozens of people in regions of South Mexico, underscoring the hazards of steep and windy roads where fatalities are frequent. Over in the Netherlands and Germany, the countries were slammed by a rare summer storm, killing two people and paralyzing air travel and train services. Packing howling winds of up to 146 kilometers per hour, Storm Polly brought hurricane force winds to Western Europe, slamming both the Netherlands and Germany on Wednesday. According to the Associated Press, the storm has taken the lives of two people, a 51-year-old woman in the Netherlands and a 64-year-old woman in Germany. Polly is said to be one of the most powerful summer storms to impact the Netherlands in 50 years, leading to the cancellation of some 400 flights from Amsterdam's Schiphol Airport, one of Europe's busiest hubs. Rail service was also severely impacted across the northern part of the country. The National Meteorology Institute issued its highest cold red storm warning for the Nord-Holland province and urged residents not to leave their homes. 
The German Weather Service, meanwhile, issued a level three red warning, the second highest level for northern parts of the country, including Hamburg. The powerful winds have also toppled dozens of trees in Amsterdam, damaged cars and houseboats, and injured several people. The number of fallen trees rose due to them becoming brittle from an unusually long dry spell in May and June. Down trees also led to a highway north of Amsterdam being closed, while tram and bus traffic was heavily disrupted in the capital. Winds have eased up a bit, with the Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute downgrading the storm to cold yellow. The storm is considered quite rare for this time of year, as windstorms like Polly are usually seen during the late autumn to early springtime period. Now to a major shakeup coming to social media and Instagram and parent company Meta launched a direct challenge to Twitter. It's shaping up to be a battle of the big tech and big personalities. The latest battle between billionaires Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk is on. Tonight, Instagram and parent company Meta launched a new app called Threads, a text-based offering taking direct aim at Musk's Twitter and that platform's roughly 360 million users. Earlier today, Meta founder Mark Zuckerberg's apparent initial post saying, let's do this, visible to a select few given early access to threads. Content creator Drexley, who makes money as an influencer on Instagram, selected today for a sneak peek, and he's already posted 10 times. The growing rivalry between Zuckerberg and Musk might even get physical. The two trading barbs about a potential cage match. But is their battle for microbloggers that is the prize fight of the moment? Zuckerberg potentially sensing Twitter's vulnerability after a string of what some see as Musk's social media mishaps. Just days ago, imposing limits on how many posts Twitter users can read per day. Musk's controversial comments also pushing users and advertisers away. I'll say what I want to say, and if, 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 uh, if the consequence of that is losing money, so be it. And with threads appearing to allow users to log in with their Instagram handle, leveraging that platform's more than 2 billion users, it has the potential to be a knockout. Welcome back to World News, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Europe's Ariane 5 rocket blasted off from French Guiana for the final time, carrying two military communication satellites and leaving its nations with a vacuum in autonomous access to space for the first time in more than four decades. Maruti Suzuki, India's biggest automaker, is looking to break into the premium car segment with its new seven-seater. Maruti, known for its small compact cars that are mostly priced below 1 million rupees, launched the Invictor seven-seater with a hybrid power strain starting from around 2.5 million rupees. The US Navy said that it had intervened to prevent Iran from seizing two commercial tankers in the Gulf of Oman in the latest in the series of attacks on ships in the area since 2019. The head of the provincial government confirmed that at least 16 people were killed in an informal settlement near Boxburg, east of Johannesburg, following a suspected gas leak after a recount of fatalities. A South African media reporter said that the gas leak could have been linked to suspected illegal mining activities. Twelve countries in Africa will receive 18 million doses of the malaria vaccine over the next two years, expanding access to nine countries that were previously not on the list. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with visuals of Sphere, a new Las Vegas venue claimed to be the world's largest spherical structure, showing off its impressive displays of light. Stay safe and have a good night.